Welcome everyone to our Sunday worship on behalf of Sleaford Methodist Circuit. My name is Paul Coburn. We're going to begin with two prayers of praise. I liked both of these and couldn't choose between them. So I'm reading them both. And if one doesn't particularly strike a chord with you, then maybe the other one will. The first one is headed, seeing is praising. Let us pray. Flying high above the clouds, we look down in wonder as we see the earth spread out below like some huge patchwork quilt. The land and the sea seem as if they are etched on our slowly spinning world. We praise you for the lofty mountains that seem to reach up to touch us and the rivers that twist and turn their way towards the seas and the oceans that stretch as far as the eye can see. We praise you for the sky above us, its deep ebony backcloth hints at the endless universe that lies beyond the reach of our eyes. We praise you for the stars that shine from distances too incredible to reach, too vast to imagine. Yet each and every one of them is held in the hollow of your hand. No song is too high or too lowly, no word too majestic or too holy, no worship too traditional or too informal, no service too great or too small. You gather all things up for your praise and glory. Everything we see and hear declares the praise of our all-seeing, all-knowing, all-loving God. Amen. Wonderful God, we praise you that you are God beyond our imagining. When we confess that you have no beginning and no end, we do not understand what our words really mean, but we believe that who and what you are is worthy of all our praise. We praise you because you are our God and you are almighty all-knowing and all-loving. Sovereign Lord, there are no words too high, no thoughts too extravagant, no idea of you too holy to celebrate your glory. You move our hearts, you fill our minds, you energise our whole being with your presence. We bring our praise today not because we must, not because we are able, not even because we want to, but because you are worthy. We bring our praise in the name of Christ, who has shown us your glory. Amen. And let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. I thought I would begin today with telling you the aim of what I'm hoping to achieve. I've uh, attended in years gone by um, an interview for a teacher and uh, teachers these days seem to do things somewhat differently to when I was a pupil and being taught. 
And one of the things, or at least in the interview situation, one of the things that they do uh, is they, they say at the beginning of the class what the aim is. And then at the end, they ask, have we fulfilled the aim? So uh, I'm going to say what it is. Now, I, d I don't have a, a whiteboard here, but by the magic of um, computer technology, I, I, I'm going to write on this this whiteboard and words will appear. Look at this. I'm, I'm hoping this is right. Uh, OK, this is the aim for today. OK, this is the aim of what we're, we're about. I'm aiming. There we are. Something like that. I am aiming to uh, remind you of the wonder and privilege of knowing God and having God as a presence in your life. And in particular, I'm thinking of God the Son, who we know as Jesus, and I'm thinking of God the Spirit. But knowing Jesus, knowing the Spirit, and having Jesus and having the Spirit as a living presence in our lives. It's a wonderful thing. It's a thing of great privilege. And that's really my main aim. Although there's two sort of follow on things from that that I will mention in passing. And that is, if we realise the wonder of this, um, then every day we should be thankful for it and give praise to God. And every day we should be looking at ways that we can help other people discover the same wonder and the same privilege. OK, that's where we, we're aiming to get to. The starting point is John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 15 to 21. This is the set gospel reading for today. And it's part of the, the long uh, conversation that Jesus had with his disciples at the Last Supper. If you love me, said Jesus, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me any more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Thanks be to God for his word, and may his spirit of truth help us in understanding what he wants to say today through these words to us. Because there's a lot of stuff in here that we could go through almost word by word, phrase by phrase, and try and wrap our minds around it. But I'm not going to go into every detail of everything that Jesus said here. I want to pick out two themes that actually end us up in pretty much the same place, but two themes. And one is about uh, the word seeing and coupled with that the word knowing and the other is a simple word in but we're going to look at seeing and knowing first of all and th there are uh, three places where that concept comes up in speaking of the spirit of truth jesus says the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him. Okay. Later on, 
He says, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And then the very last phrase talks about those who keep his commands and who love him and whom he loves. And it says, uh, I will love them and show myself to them. It doesn't use the word see there, but Jesus showing himself is, is part of that process by which we see him and know him. There is a difference between just seeing something and knowing something. Uh, although sometimes we use the word see almost to mean we know. Uh, if, I, if I say, oh, I see, I mean, I understand, uh, I, I now realise uh, it's become part of my knowledge. It's not just a matter of eyesight, what's going on in my eyes, but what's going on in my head. Uh, oh yes, I see, I understand, I know it now, I've grasped it. A, a small incident in my life which uh, illustrates the difference between seeing and knowing is when I was a minister down um, in Orpington uh, on the edge of London and one of the meetings that I, I had was, uh, I can't remember where exactly, but it was in a, a, an inner part of London. I had to drive further in uh, to a, a, a bit of London I didn't know, but I'd, I'd taken a map with me so I'd worked out how to get home again afterwards. And on the way home, I was driving through unfamiliar uh, parts of, of London. Uh, but as I drove, I came to some traffic lights and I, I stopped and ahead of me, I could see um, a road stretching ahead, an unfamiliar road. And I sat there and I looked at this road for a moment or two, waiting for the, the lights to turn green. And as I looked, I saw a sign pointing to the crematorium off to my left. And I thought, just a moment, I know that crematorium, I travel there on many occasions. So if that's the way to the crematorium, I must have come back from it this way. I must have come down to these traffic lights from the left and then turned left and gone onto the road I see ahead of me. And then as I looked, uh, this unfamiliar road ahead of me, it suddenly became known. Of course I know this road. Yes, I recognise that shop. I recognise that business. I, I've driven on this road loads of times. And it was a weird feeling how sitting there, I, I was seeing something unfamiliar and then suddenly, oh, I know this. I know where I am. I know where I'm going. A very sort of odd feeling. Nothing physically had changed in what I could see, but it had somehow become known to me. There's a difference between just seeing stuff and actually absorbing it, taking it in, knowing it. When Jesus talks about the spirit of truth, it says the world can't see or know the spirit, but but you can, he says to the disciples. Well. How is that? How do we see the Spirit? The Spirit is the Spirit, uh, um, part of the Godhead, yes. But how do we see the Spirit? There's nothing physical that we can look at. But Jesus gives us a clue in some earlier words from the Gospel of John uh, when he talked about uh, the Spirit blows where it will. Uh, you don't, it's not the spirit, I'm getting my quote wrong here. The wind, the wind blows where it will. Uh, it comes and goes and you don't know where it's coming and where it's going. And he says, that's like it is with the ones born of the spirit. That image gives us a clue as to how we see the spirit. We can't see the wind. The wind is invisible in terms of physical things. But we see the trees and we see them moving and we see the smoke coming from a chimney and we see how that moves to the side and we see the clouds and how they're traveling across the sky and we know 
This is the wind at work. We, we see its effects. That is how it is with the Spirit. We might not see physically the Holy Spirit, but we see the Spirit at work in the events happening around us, in the life of the church, in our own lives, in the people we meet. We see the Spirit at work. If we have eyes to see, the world doesn't see that. The world just looks at stuff and thinks, oh, well, it's just stuff happening. But once we get to know the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, we begin to, to see our eyes are opened. Like my encounter at those traffic lights where I'm at one moment just looking at unfamiliar stuff, houses, shops, road, and then, oh, I know it. I recognise it. I see what's going on here. I see in the sense of understanding with my head, with my brain. And we see the spirit at work like that because we're followers of Christ and we learn to recognise when the spirit is active. But it's something that the world doesn't see. We, we have a, a privilege in being able to see this. It's, it's a wonder, it's a delight. And Jesus goes on to speak in the same way of himself. Soon, he says, the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. When he was living out his ministry on this earth, a lot of people actually saw him physically in the flesh. They, they went to see what he looked like. They listened to him. Lots of people uh, of all kinds and conditions of, of people saw Jesus but there was coming a time soon when this would no longer be true. They saw him crucified, the body taken down, buried in a tomb, and that was the last the world saw of Jesus. But the disciples saw him again, not as a dead body, but as a risen Lord, a risen Saviour, their friend back from the dead. They saw him on several occasions, we're still in that Easter season where um, for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples. In the Christian calendar, we're still within those 40 days since Easter. The disciples saw Jesus and knew him for who he was, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, the one who had conquered death. We don't see Jesus in that same physical sense. He's now ascended to heaven. And it's only very rarely that people actually have a vision in which they are able to see Jesus through their physical eyes. Um, but we see what Jesus is doing. Again, in our world, in our lives, we see him in the gospel stories. Uh, we have to use our imagination to some extent. We read the words and we picture him in our minds and we might have all kinds of um, images in our mind about what Jesus actually looks like and probably all of them are wrong and he probably looks like nothing like anything we imagine. But we, we get a picture of the kind of things he did and the things he said uh, and even if he didn't speak English, um, we hear him speak in English because that's the only way we can perceive it. And we, we see Jesus and we get to know Jesus. Not because our sight is better than the sight of the average person in the world, but because he shows himself to us. He says that th those who keep his commands, they're the ones that love him. They're the ones that he loves. They're the ones to whom he shows himself. It's not that we're able to see Jesus because of our merit. It's only because Jesus reveals himself to us. He shows himself through the spirit of truth, working in our hearts, the spirit interceding with our spirits and, and making us understand and know who Jesus is. But it's a wonderful privilege and it's not something that everyone has. There are plenty of people who, who have not seen Jesus, who do not know Jesus in their hearts, who've got no awareness or consciousness of the Spirit. We do. 
those of us who follow Jesus, we've seen him, we've known him, and that should be a cause for giving thanks to God every day of our lives. And it should be a, an impetus to evangelism too, to try and find ways to help others discover that same privilege that we've discovered. It's not that we're better than anybody else because of this. Um, we don't look down on other people and feel that we are superior because we've done nothing to merit this. It might make us better people in the sense that we try to live better lives. We, we try to be good people and to behave better, um, but it doesn't make us superior. We're privileged. We ought to share this wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus with as many as we can. We want others to find the same joy as we have found. Seeing and knowing Jesus, seeing and knowing the Spirit. But I said there was another word that I was going to look at, and that's a, a, a tiny word, the word in, which uh, appears uh, different places in this passage. And it's used in significant ways, even if it's a small word, a small word. Uh, four times someone is described as being in someone else. Uh, here we are, where are we? The um, bit about the Spirit. You know him, says Jesus, talking of the Spirit. You know him, he lives with you and will be in you. And then there's three other uh, appearances of that word all in the same verse. Uh, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Now, in, in physical terms, we know what it is to be in something, one thing in another. Uh, the smaller thing goes inside the bigger thing. When we're talking about people, that makes less sense. You can't say that one person is in another in that physical sense, other than perhaps a pregnant woman who has a baby in her, literally. But otherwise, we're talking in some metaphorical sense here. Uh, and it still makes some kind of sense part way. Jesus is in the Father, he says. And he also says, we are in Jesus. We are in him. And he says earlier on that the Spirit is in us. And it makes me think in physical terms, like those Russian dolls that stack inside one another. Uh, Jesus in the Father, and we are in Jesus, and the Spirit is in us. Uh, you, you can see it like a sort of nested series of dolls. But one bit doesn't quite fit here. Uh, the spirit in us, that's fine. Us in Jesus, that's fine. But the, the three that go together, he says, you'll realise I'm in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now, when we're thinking too physically about this, that's not quite making sense. There's a paradox there. How can A be in B and B be in A? Surely the smaller has to be inside the bigger. It can't work the other way around as well. Not unless you've got some kind of science fiction story going on, like uh, Doctor Who. I, I remember um, an, an episode in the very early Doctor Who series, William Hartnell in his era, and I can't remember all the story, but the master, who was the Doctor's enemy, also had a TARDIS, one of those things that's bigger on the inside than the outside. Um, and it, it looked like, um, as I remember, a sort of big metal filing cabinet. It wasn't so nice to look at as the police box uh, appearance of a TARDIS. But it was a TARDIS, same as the Doctor's. And the Doctor's TARDIS had materialised inside the Master's TARDIS. So if they were to open their door and go out, they'd be inside the Master's TARDIS. But somehow the Master's TARDIS is also materialised inside the Doctor's TARDIS. So 
inside the Doctor's TARDIS was this sort of metal filing cabinet, which was the Master's TARDIS, which they were also inside. And if they went out their door, they'd be inside this cabinet. It, it was very odd and very paradoxical. I can't even remember how it resolved, but the image stuck with me over the many years. Us in Jesus, Jesus in us. Well, there's no real paradox in that same physical way because we're not talking about physical things. You could, for example, say um, that I was in the Scouts when I was younger. That's true, I was in the Scouts. You could say that Scouting is in my blood. That wouldn't be true, to be honest. Uh, once I grew up and left the Scouts, I, I've not had any great involvement with the Scouting movement since then. But some people have. And for them, it would be tr true to say that those Scout leaders, for example, that, uh, that led Scouts when I, was, uh, when I was in the Scouts, they were in Scouting in the sense that they were part of this bigger movement. Scouting is much bigger than the individual Scoutmaster. They were in Scouting. That was the bigger thing, that they were just a part of it. And yet it's also true to say that scouting as a, as a concept, as an ideal, was part of them. It was part of their lives. It wasn't the whole of who they were. They, they were more than just scouting. They were bigger than scouting in that sense. But it was part of who they were. So my scoutmaster, you could say, was in scouting and scouting was in him. And that's not a great paradox, it's, it's uh, just using language in, in different ways. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We're in Christ because he's bigger than us. Christ is the Son of God, the Creator. Through him the world was made. Uh, we're only a little bit of that, we're part of his creation. So, of course, to be in him is, means that we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. But it's also true that Jesus is part of our lives. He's in us. And not just as an interest or a hobby or something like that. As regular viewers will know, uh, one of my interests over many years now, uh, has been J.R.R. Tolkien and his stories, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. I came across them long ago. I enjoy them as stories. I've read them more than once. And there's a whole world that Tolkien created, which is fascinating to get to know better and explore and meet other people who are also fascinated. I've been to Tolkien conferences from time to time. Uh, so you could say that Tolkien is in me in that sense. He's, he's an interest that I have and he, he is part of what makes up Paul Coburn. But that doesn't mean I've got any relationship with him. He's dead now. Uh, he's not alive. He exists as a, an author who I like and whose books still exist and uh, Many people write a lot of stuff about him. There's all kinds of things that I don't yet know about him and probably never, never will. But um, he exists as a concept, as an idea, but I've got no relationship with Tolkien. And even if um, my uh, particular interest, uh, you know, whether it was a particular author or a, a sports person or a composer or whoever, even if it was someone that I, I really felt I had a rapport with and I it was part of my life, even if they were still alive, it, it wouldn't mean that I had a relationship with them. There are living authors that I, I know and like, but if I met them on the street, it, it, they wouldn't know me. I wouldn't have any relationship with them. But Jesus in us is not like that because his is a living relationship. He is a, a living presence in our life, not just an interesting idea or concept. And for many people, that's all he is. 
people will read about Jesus in the Gospels and discover that he said some fascinating things and, and see in him a role model to follow uh, and, and an exciting life that he lived and a tragic death and even conquering death. People may even believe all that. And yet he's just a, a figure from history, uh, a role model to follow. And that Jesus is more than that. When Jesus said he would be in us, it means that he, his relationship with us would, would be a presence in our lives. He's not just a, a concept, but a person. The spirit of truth makes that possible. Jesus wasn't going to abandon us. The relationship with him wasn't going to end, as it does with some people who might be a living inspiration and then they die and, and that's it. We're left with our memories of them and they continue to inspire us, those memories, but the person's gone, no longer part of our lives. Jesus is alive. He's with us still, part of our lives. We, we have that ongoing relationship and the spirit of truth is, is the one who makes that known to us. So again, we come to the same point, really, the wonder of this. And it is a wonder. And in a way, it is a paradox that the Lord Jesus, who was there at the dawn of creation and through whom everything was made, that, that he is, is the person in whom we live and move and have our being, the, the vast one out there. We are in him. And yet, in Jesus, God became part of his creation and became small enough to be in us, to be in, a, in human beings' hearts and in our lives. It's, it's a wonderful thing and in one way a paradoxical thing, but a great privilege and one that we should be grateful for every day and one that we should work to encourage other people to discover for themselves. So, Amen. And uh, have, I, have I reached my aim? This is what I'd uh, said I was aiming to do. Have I succeeded? Well, only you know, and God knows. I hope at least one or two of the viewers will feel that I've achieved something of what I set out to achieve. We're going to sing before we finish, and then a short prayer, um, and then we'll, we'll close. We're going to sing, I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy the blessed assurance gives. <laughs>
Now may you know the spirit of truth speaking and living within your life. May you know the risen Lord Jesus as part of your day-to-day -day experience. May your love for him and your keeping of his commands grow and flourish day by day. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you evermore. Amen.